This lecture is on pericardial effusion evaluation in the intensive care unit or emergency medicine setting. So think about a clinical case. Patient presents with speaking partial sentences, saturated 78%, confused. Uh, what do you do? Obviously, I mean, you do all the ABCs, but at some point you may want to incorporate ultrasound into your clinical decision making. And, uh, you know, you may, one of the things that you may run across is a pericardial effusion. Remember, in these situations, we don't really have a lot of time. Uh, we identify the problem as the patient is hypoxic or hypotensive. You don't have the golden hour of time to order, get a reader, and then actually make the decision. So what we're doing here is called point of care ultrasound or point of care cardiac evaluation. And we're looking for specific, specific uh, uh, conditions that we may be able to immediately offer treatment for. So as you see, as we go through some of the other uh, cardiac uh, lectures in the cardiac modules and shock modules, you'll see this little table here. <laughs> Essentially, it's, it's, it talks about the causes of hemodynamic collapse that can potentially be diagnosed using echo from subcostal window or from the peristernal windows. And one of the ones that we're going to talk about today in specific is tamponade. <laughs> tamponade from a pericardial fusion. And what kind of things you can look for on ultrasound to kind of help you identify that. Remember, as we go forward in the next few five to ten years, uh, we're probably going to have more access to handheld echocardiography. So this will actually be part of the management for cardiac arrest. There's already multiple articles out that talk about using ultrasound for cardiac activity uh, car in cardiac arrest and incorporate it for evaluation of uh, many things, including pericardial fusion. So this is another article that recently came out a couple of years ago called CAUSE, uh, Cardiac Arrest Ultrasound Exam. It just kind of goes through an algorithm that you can use while you're doing your unresponsive patient. If you look, it kind of talks about unresponsive, uh, start CPR, and then you know when you're going to actually get to the ultrasound exam where you look at essentially the ventricles and the lungs. So in this particular sense, you're looking for pericardial effusion and a collapse RV, which would signify tamponade for you. And we're going to go through a few slides that may help you uh, improve your skill, skill of acquisition of that. So remember, what we're looking for is the pump. We're looking at, when we're looking at the pump in cardiac arrest patients or hypotensive patients, we're looking for pericardial fusion. We're looking for global contractility of the left ventricle. And we're looking for relative size of the right ventricle to the left ventricle. Again, obviously, in this particular short lecture, we're looking for just pericardial effusion. But at some point, when you try to evaluate all this all at the same time, you need to be an expert at the individual uh, diagnoses. So back to the pump. What is the probe you're going to use? You're going to use a cardiac probe, which is a, usually a lower frequency, higher frame rate probe, so that we can evaluate the function a little bit better. For pericardial effusion, what you're going to be looking at is in the peristernal long view and the peristernal uh, short, as well as the subcostal view. Pretty much any of the views, uh, you would be able to see pericardial effusions, but you're trying to evaluate the right ventricle and right atrium collapse. So this is just a diagram showing all the different views. Refer back to the basic cardiac ultrasound exam uh, that we have uh, in the module. Uh, to kind of review which views are present and what the structures are that are available to watch. So again, you're looking for a fusion around the pump. So before we go into the actual things that cause tam ca indicate tamponade, let's talk a little bit about how you even identify a pericardial fusion. So this is the peristernal long view. You can see here there's a mitral valve. This is the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle. And the pericardial fusion will be around the heart actually. And this bright white hyperechoic line is the pericardium. And you're gonna see an anechoic space around the heart. One of the most important things is to realize that in the peristernal long view, you always have a descending aorta. <clears throat> if you have a pericardial effusion that goes anterior, well, if you have an anechoic space that goes anterior to the descending aorta, that is a pericardial effusion. They sometimes call it rat tailing. If you have an anechoic space that goes posterior this way from the descending aorta, that's actually a left-sided pleural effusion. They can be fairly large and sometimes can confuse you. 
don't worry, I have some images that show both so you can kind of get a sense of what I'm talking about. <laughs> so remember, descending aorta is an important structure to identify when looking for effusions in general. Here's a pericardial effusion, large pericardial effusion, and you can't really see the descending aorta that well because of the, the way this ultrasound is showing the hyper hyperechoic, but I'm going to show you some import, some better views than this. But it gives you a sense of where what I'm talking about. Now there are graves of effusions. <clears throat> Small is less than 10 millimeters, moderate is 10 to 15, and large is greater than 15. But that depends on where you're measuring also and whether what axis you're on. And a lot of times when you're in the long axis, you may actually be cutting the heart at the wrong, at the wrong spot, and you can actually uh, misgrade these effusions. What's more important to us is, 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 is the effusion causing tamponade? And again, we're going to go through those things, but I want to show you a few more effusions first. So first, here's a descending aorta. And you can see that here's a cardiac, here's a pericardial effusion, here's the hyperechoic region, and you can see that it's going anterior to the descending aorta. So we can be more sure that that is a pericardial effusion. Here's what I was telling you about where you see essentially a pericardial effusion and a pleural effusion. So if you look at the pericardial effusion, you can see it going up anterior to the descending aorta. But here you see the pleural effusion go descending, it's not even reaching up to it. A lot of times you can even actually see it all the way back here going behind the descending aorta. <coughs> now sometimes you can confuse yourself with pericardial fat. So essentially this is just a layer of pericardial fat right here <coughs> or right here. Uh, this could be a small pericardial effusion and there's the pericardial fat. The more of these you do and the <coughs> ultrasound machine is getting improved and better, you have less, it's easier to find that distinction out. <coughs> Again, remember for us in the ICU, that doesn't matter as much as uh, the actual tamponade. This is a sub xiphoid or subcostal view. You know that because uh, you essentially see liver up here. You can see this is the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the closest chamber to the chest wall. You can see a little pericardial fat pad and a pericardial effusion. Just a couple of slides to show you that. So now what's important? What's important to us is, is there tamponade? So what are some of the hallmarks of tamponade? Well, right ventricular free wall inversion, best recognized during diastole. The, the atrium is actually less pressure, so you can actually see that earlier, right atrial inversion during systolic is a more common and early finding. You can have increased respiratory variation of the mitral or aortic inflow velocities, although in the ICU world, we don't really calculate those. You can have a dilated inferior vena cava with decreased inspiratory collapse, but that's not always found also. So here's an image of a, a subcostal view because we know there's a liver. Here's a pericardial effusion. And even though the right atrium is still open, the right ventricle is collapsed, <coughs> indicating a high pressure or, or a pericardial effusion that is more recent in accumulation. Here's it, in, here's it in actually play. So this is the liver, this is the pericardial fusion. You can see the ventricle is collapsing, sometimes opening up a little bit. This is just to show you an apical view and a subcostal view. You can see the pericardial fusion in both of those. The last couple of slides, I want to show you some images from our own <coughs> repository here. So <coughs> here you see a short axis view of the, of the heart. You, can know, you know that because you can see papillary muscles. One finding is that the LV volumes are very small here. And if you know you're at the papillary muscle level, you know you're fairly high up on the, on the heart. So if the patient is laying supine or if they're sitting upright, this is at least a moderate pericardial effusion. You can see the pericardial effusion here and here. <coughs> Here's a pericardial Peristernal long view, again, you see the pericardial effusion and it goes anterior to the descending aorta. You actually see the per uh, left pleural effusion here also. It's kind of hard to tell if the, left, if the right ventricle is being collapsed, but you do know that this is a pericardial effusion. Here's a short axis view when obtaining, after obtaining subcostal. It looks like they turned it 90 degrees and you can see a subcostal view. 
It looks like they were looking for function here, but you can still see a small pericardial fusion around the heart here. Again, it's hard to tell if there's a tamponade because we're not looking at the right ventricle. So here's a picture where you can actually see the, the heart. It's actually uh, electrical. If you were trying to correlate this to like an electric EKG finding, it would be electrical alternates. <laughs> you can see that the heart is kind of swaying back and forth, and that's because the fusion is fairly large. It's similar to the one we saw previously, but you can see that the heart is actually moving back and forth more than normal. <coughs> All right, so remember when we're, <coughs> this is the final slide, remember when we're evaluating pericardial effusions, what's important for us in the emergency room or <coughs> the intensive care unit is not so much as if there is an infusion, effusion, although you do have to learn the distinction between effusions and pleural effusions and pericardial effusions. But what's more important to us is, is there tamponade or not? And remember, the hallmark is RV free wall inversion, best recognized during diastole, right atrial inversion during systolic motion, more common in early finding, and Increased respiratory variation of mitral and aortic inflow and dilated inferior vena cava are less common findings, but still, still there. So remember, these are the kind of things you're looking for once you identify the pericardial effusion. And that's it.